If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series. So we bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We're so thankful that you've given us your word, which is a sure guide in a world that seems to be spinning out of control. Father, we ask that as we study today about two very important words in the Old and New Testament, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, open our minds and our hearts to receive the seed of truth. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of speaking your truth. I ask, Lord, that you will give me divine wisdom. For I ask it in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today we are going to study two very important words, one in the Old Testament and another in the New Testament. However, before we get into the study of these two words, before I tell you what they are, I would like to say that the New Testament authors had a very frustrating time trying to transmit correct ideas about the state of the dead. And I'll explain the reason why. The word spirit, the word soul, and the word Hades, which is one of the words that we're going to study tonight, were very prevalent and common in the world in which the New Testament authors wrote. The only problem is those words had a different connotation in Greek philosophy. You see the word psyche, the word pneuma, the word Hades, were very commonly used by the Greeks to express an immortal soul and to express a place of eternal burning. Now the New Testament authors had to use the same terminology because they were writing in Greek. However, the words that they used were the same as the words in the Greek world, but the connotation was not the connotation of the Greek language. The connotation was that of the equivalent Hebrew words in the Old Testament. In other words, we are not to understand the word psyche, the word pneuma, and the word Hades in the light of the way it was understood by the people in Christ's day as a result of Greek philosophy, these words are to be understood according to their Hebrew equivalents in the Old Testament. And of course, the equivalent of the word pneuma is ruach and neshama. The equivalent of the word psyche is nephesh. And we're going to notice that the equivalent of the word Hades in the Old Testament is Sheol. So basically, we need to understand that the background to these New Testament words is not to be found in the way they were used in Greek philosophy, it is to be found in the way in which the equivalent words were used in the Hebrew language. Now with this in mind, I would like to say that we are going to study two key words in the Bible. One is in the Old Testament and the other is in the New Testament. Let's take a look, first of all, at the Hebrew word Sheol. That's S-H-E-O-L. The Hebrew word Sheol appears approximately 61 times or 60 plus times in the Old Testament. In the King James Version, it is translated with the word grave 30 times. It is translated with the word hell 31 times. And a handful of times in the King James Version of the Old Testament, it is translated pit. The key uh, verses that we want to notice are the 61 times where in the King James the word Sheol is translated as grave or as hell. Now, in the overwhelming majority of the cases where the King James translates the word Sheol as hell, 
the King James could have just as well translated grave instead of hell. We're going to notice that uniformly throughout the Old Testament this word Sheol should really be translated grave or sepulcher. But for some strange reason the King James translators decided that they would translate 30 references as uh, grave and 31 references as hell when really all of the references should be translated as grave or sepulcher. Now what I would like to do is go through several texts that we find in the Old Testament where the word Sheol is used. And we're going to, we're going to read first of all texts where the King James translates the word Sheol with the word grave. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6. Uh, remember that this is uh, where the King James translates the word Sheol as grave. It says there in 1 Samuel 2 verse 6, and notice the synonymous parallelism, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Do you see the synonymous parallelism there? The second line repeating the same thought of the first line. Once again the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave, that's the word Sheol, and brings up. There the King James translators have translated correctly the word Sheol as grave. And by the way all of the texts that I am reading are from the New King James unless I mention otherwise. Now let's go to Psalm 49 and verses 14 and 15. Psalm 49 verses 14 and 15. Another verse where the King James translates grave, the word Sheol. It says there in Psalm 49 verse 14, like sheep they are laid in the grave. That's the word Sheol. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. So what happens in the grave? You're what? you're dead, that's right, death shall feed on them, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling, but God will redeem my soul, it's the word nephesh, we've studied this word already, God will redeem my soul, that is my life, from the power of the what? from the power of the grave, there's the word Sheol again, from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. So you'll notice here that God is going to redeem his life from where? From the grave. Not from hell, not from a place of burning, but from the grave where we are told here that death feeds upon them. So the King James has translated correctly here the word Sheol. It means grave. Notice Psalm 89 and verse 48. We're going to read several texts because I don't want you to think that I'm just taking a sampling of texts that are convenient to my point of view. Uh, we could actually read all of them and you would see that in all of them the word Sheol could actually be translated grave or sepulcher. Psalm 89 and verse 48. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life, by the way that's the word nephesh again, it could be translated soul, can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Do you notice the synonymous parallelism again? The word grave is coupled with which word? It is coupled with the word death. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? So once again, grave is linked with the word death. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. This is a very well known verse. It's used very frequently by Seventh-day Adventists when we're talking about the state of the dead. It says there, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, or device, or knowledge, or wisdom in the grave where you are going, in Sheol where you are going. Once again the King James translates correctly, grave. But notice that in the grave there is no work, no device, no knowledge, and no wisdom. 
Go with me now to Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 10. Isaiah 38 and verse 10. And I want you to notice uh, how once again the word Sheol is uh, referring to the place that people go to when their life is shortened by death. It says there, I said, in the prime of my life I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I want you to remember the word gates, that's important, it's linked with the word Sheol. And by the way the word Sheol here uh, is translated the grave in the King James Version. I said in the prime of my life else I shall go to the gates of Sheol. Now what does that mean to go to the gates of Sheol? Notice the explanation. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. What does it mean to go to Sheol? It means that you are deprived of the remainder of your years. In other words your life is shortened by the experience of death. Notice Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 18. We're right there so we should be able to read this quickly. It says in Isaiah 38 verse 18, For Sheol, this is the New King James, they actually transliterate the word, For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. Three ideas linked here. The word Sheol, the word death, and the word pit. And you'll notice that those who go to Sheol or the grave cannot thank God, they cannot praise God, and those who go down to the pit cannot hope for God's truth. Notice I, uh, Psalm 6 and verse 5. Psalm 6 and verse 5. Once again you have the same idea of death being linked with Sheol or being linked with the grave. It says there in Psalm 6 verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you. And then notice the synonymous parallelism in the second part of the verse. It says, For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? And of course the question is what? The, the question is answered how? No one will give you thanks in the grave. So once again, death and grave or Sheol are coupled together. Now go with me to Job 14 verses 10 through 15. We're still noticing verses where the King James Version translates the word grave. And by the way the New King James sometimes simply transliterates the word and puts Sheol as it appears in the Hebrew. Notice Job 14 verses 10 through 15. Here Job is describing his experience. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed he breathes his last. What happens when a person dies? They what? They breathe their last. And where is he? Is what Job asks. As water disappears from the sea and a river become, becomes parched and dried up. So man lies down. Where do you lie down by the way? in the grave of course when you die. So man lies down and does not rise. Until when? Till the heavens are no more they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Is there the hope of a resurrection according to Job? Absolutely. Then he says this, Oh that you would hide me in the grave. That's the word Sheol. So did Job in his suffering want to go to Sheol? Obviously he did not want to go to hell. He was not saying, oh that you would hide me in hell. The word Sheol cannot mean hell there because Job wouldn't want to go there. And so it says, oh that you would hide me in the grave, that is in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. Glorious passage on the resurrection. And Job actually in his suffering he's saying, Oh Lord, if you would just hide me in Sheol. Is he actually begging God to send him to hell? Of course not. He's saying, I wish that you would 
place me where? resting, sleeping, he speaks about sleep, death as sleep, I wish you would put me to sleep in the grave and then when you come and you call I would answer your voice let's read one more Job 7 and verse 9 where the King James Version translates with the word grave Job 7 and verse 9 it says here as the cloud disappears and vanishes away so he who goes down to the grave that is to Sheol does not come up so when you go to Sheol what happens to you? you're like a cloud that disappears and what? and vanishes away because in the grave what happens to our body? we disintegrate now let's notice a few examples where the King James Version translates with the word hell by the way I'm a great admirer of the King James Version but I must say as I've said before in uh, previous lectures that when it comes to the state of the dead the New International Version is a better translation it's closer to the intention that God had when he's speaking about the state of man and death now that doesn't mean that everything in the NIV is good and perfect because they leave out several passages, they have mistranslations, what I'm saying is that every translation has its pros and its cons but when it comes to the state of the dead the King James actually is very confusing when it speaks about the word Sheol and we'll also notice that it's very confusing when it comes to the word Hades in the New Testament now let's notice several texts where the King James translates the word Sheol with hell and you tell me if the King James translators could have used the word grave just as well notice Psalm 116 and verse 3 Psalm 116 and verse 3 for some unexplained reason the King James translators thought that they needed to translate the word Sheol 31 times with the word hell when it could have very well been translated grave it says in Psalm 116 verse 3 the pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me I found trouble and sorrow let me ask you could the word Sheol have been very well translated grave there? of course it's coupled once again with what word? death, just like the other verses so it, the King James could have said the pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol, which it, which it actually says hell in the King James, I'm reading from the New King James has laid hold of me and I found trouble and sorrow very well the word Sheol could have been translated grave there by the King James Version Proverbs 7 verse 27 Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 27 I want you to notice the synonymous parallelism that we have here in this verse it says there in Proverbs 7 verse 27 her house, speaking about the, the evil woman, the evil and wicked woman says her house is the way to hell even the New King James translates hell here her house is the way to hell better translation would be what? the grave, descending to the chambers of what? death, so once again Sheol is coupled with death, it could have very well been translated that her house is the way to the grave descending to the chambers of death, there's no need to link this with hell or to link it with fire notice Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 5 Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 5 and I want you to underline the synonymous parallelism again it says there, speaking about the strange woman who tries to entice men into sin it says, her feet go down to death her steps lay hold of hell once again death and Sheol are linked together would it be proper to translate this her feet go down to death her steps lay hold of the grave yes once again the two ideas are linked together by the way do you notice that feet go down to death is the same as her steps lay hold of hell it is a synonymous parallelism notice Proverbs 15 and verse 24 
Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 24 and here we have an antithetical parallelism in other words what is said in the first line the opposite is said in the second line it says there in Proverbs 15 verse 24 the way of life winds upward for the wise that he may turn away from where? from where? from hell below could that have been translated from the grave below? of course the contrast is between above and below the contrast is not between heaven and hell and so it says the way of life winds upward for the wise that he may turn away from the grave below notice Isaiah 28 and verse 15 Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 15 again notice the synonymous parallelism in this verse it says in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 15 because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we are in agreement the New King James transliterates Sheol but the King James Version translates hell in other words the King James says we have made a covenant with death and with hell we are in agreement but the fact is that the phrase we have made a covenant with death is exactly parallel to with Sheol we are in agreement a covenant, covenant is a what? is an agreement and once again the idea of Sheol is connected not with life in hell it's connected with what? with death in that verse once again notice Amos chapter 9 and verse 2 let's read two more verses and then we'll move on to the New Testament Amos chapter 9 and verse 2 speaking about uh, the wicked in Israel it says though they dig into hell by the way where do we dig into? we dig to open up a hole for the grave right? so it says though they dig into and the New King, the King James Version and the New King James Version says hell there could it be translated the grave? of course it could though they dig into the grave from there my hand shall take them though they climb up to heaven from there I will bring them down very acceptable to translate the word Sheol here not hell like the King James Version and the New King, King James Version do but rather translate grave one further verse Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2 Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2 here Jonah is in the belly of the fish and by the way he's not dead he's crying out to the Lord and notice what he says in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2 and he said I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol that's translated hell in the King James Version out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice was uh, Jonah in hell at that point? no he was in the belly of a great fish it was dark down there it was like he was where? he was in a living grave if you please so he was not in hell a proper translation would be out of the belly of the grave I cried and you heard my voice and by the way we know that it's the grave because Jesus referred to this later on about speaking when he spoke about being in the heart of the earth for three days and for three nights now let's notice what the New Testament has to say about the word Sheol and you say well pastor but the word Sheol is in Hebrew the New Testament wouldn't use that same Hebrew word obviously not but the New Testament has an exactly equivalent Greek word to the word Sheol and you say which word is equivalent to the word Sheol from the Old Testament well before I tell you let me give you some statistics the word Hades which is the word that we're going to refer to is used 11 times in the New Testament only once in those 11 times in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus which we've already discussed in this series where Jesus is not trying to teach truth he's using the, the ideas of the people 
uh, to express an idea. He's using their view of Hades and of hell. He doesn't believe it. He's using their frame of reference to teach uh, the truth. Only in that one reference do you find the word Hades linked or connected with a place of burning. Actually in all of the other ten references the word uh, Hades could be translated with grave. Now let me tell you something about the New King James Version. The New King James Version transl transliterates the word Hades all eleven times. In other words it doesn't translate the word, it simply puts Hades when that word appears. The King James Version on the other hand ten times translates the word Hades, hell. And only one time does the King James Version translate the word Hades with grave. Let's talk for a moment about the New International Version. Of the eleven times that the word Hades appears in the New Testament, twice the New International Version translates depths. Three times the New International Version translates the word Hades with the word grave. And five times the New International Version translates the word Hades, actually it doesn't even translate it, it transliterates the word. And only once in the New International Version is the word Hades translated hell, and that's in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So it's interesting that the NIV translates the word Hades ten times differently than hell, and only one time hell, whereas the King James Version translates the word ten times hell, and one time differently than the word hell, it translates it with the word grave. Now you say, how do we know, Pastor Bohr, that the word Sheol in the Old Testament is equivalent to the word Hades in the New Testament? It's very simple. You see there are two texts in the New Testament that allude to or quote verses from the Old Testament. So when you go to the New Testament and you read those verses that are quoted from the Old Testament you can know wh what word in Greek is equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol. Now let's go to our first text that uses the word Sheol and then we'll go to the New Testament text where this same verse is used but in the Greek language. It says in Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14, if you go with me, Hosea 13 and verse 14, the following, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. That's the word Sheol, incidentally. I will redeem them from death. See the synonymous parallelism again? He's going to redeem them from the power, ransom them from the power of the grave, that's Sheol. I will redeem them from death. And then notice this. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, that is O Sheol, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from their, uh, my eyes. So notice here uh, that you have O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 54 and 55. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, where this verse in Hosea is very clearly alluded to. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Do you see the allusion to Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14? It's interesting when it says, O death, where is your sting? Death is used in Hosea chapter 13. But instead of the word Sheol, the second word that is used in verse 55 of 1 Corinthians is, O Hades, where is your victory? And by the way, this is the only verse that the King James Version translates with the word grave. 1 Corinthians 
15 and verse 55, because they knew that it would be foolish to say, Oh hell, where is your victory? As if somehow the righteous had been in hell and Jesus had come to rescue them from hell. So they knew that they had to translate the word Hades here with grave. But the other 10 times they translate the word Hades in the King James Version with the word hell. So it becomes very complicated for people who are reading the Bible because they assume that Sheol and Hades are a place where people are sent to burn. Now notice the other text in the New Testament that is actually quoting from a passage in the Old Testament. Let's go to the Old Testament passage first and then we'll go to the New Testament passage. Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 10. Psalm 16 verses 8 through 10. This is a messianic prophecy about the resurrection of Jesus. It says here, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh, notice, my flesh also will rest in hope. Jesus is speaking prophetically. He says, my flesh will also rest in hope. Verse 10, for you will not leave my soul that's the word nephesh that we studied. You will not leave my soul in Sheol, it says in the New King James. By the way, in the King James it says, you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now I want you to notice the synonymous parallelism that we have in this verse. Notice that thou will not leave my soul in hell, is parallel to thou wilt not leave thy holy one to see what? Corruption. So what is it that you see in hell supposedly? You see what? Corruption. corruption. Now what is it that corrupts? It is the body. Did you notice that Jesus said my flesh will rest in hope because it will not see corruption. Now the New International Version translates this correctly. It says, you will not leave me in the grave, and you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. So in other words, the soul is Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the word Hades is translated the grave. Jesus is saying, you're not going to leave me in the grave, and I, my flesh, is not going to see what? Is not going to see corruption. Now let's notice how this passage is quoted in the New Testament. Go with me to Acts chapter 2, 25 to 27. This is on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Peter is preaching his Pentecostal sermon. And it says there in um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, For David says concerning him, that is concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For, why will his flesh rest in hope? For you will not leave my soul in Hades, this is the New King James, or as the uh, NIV says, you will not leave me in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, did you notice that the word that is used in Psalm 16, where it says, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the equivalent in the New Testament is you will not leave my soul in Hades. So the question is, is Sheol equivalent to the word Hades? Of course, in two different languages. Now let's notice other references to the word Hades in the New Testament. We've noticed two of them. Uh, we read from 1 Corinthians 15. We also read from uh, the passage in Psalm 16. But now let's notice the other references to Hades in the New Testament. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8. And you're going to notice that the word Hades, like in the Old Testament, is coupled with death. It says there in Revelation 6 verse 8, speaking about the fourth horse of Revelation, it says, So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades 
followed him. You'll notice that the New King James simply, simply transliterates the word Hades. Could this very well be translated, him who sat on it was death and the grave followed with him. Of course, what is it that follows after death? What comes immediately after death? You are what? You are buried in the grave. And then of course it says, and power was given uh, to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And so once again the word Hades here can very well be translated as grave. Notice Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. This is the famous uh, verse where uh, Jesus is speaking to Peter about the keys of the kingdom. Notice Matthew 16 and verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus is not saying that Peter is the rock. Jesus is saying, you are Peter, you are a little pebble, but upon this rock, that is upon myself, I will build my church. And then it says, and the gates of Hades, do you remember that text from the Old Testament that I told you to remember? The gates of Sheol, now we find a text in the New Testament that speaks about the gates of Hades. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Let me ask you, why is it that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church? If you look at the context, it's because Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and I'm going to resurrect the third day. Therefore the church is going to be built upon a living person, one who died and yet is alive. So this can very well be translated, the gates of the grave or the gates of the sepulcher will not be able to prevail against it because I died and I resurrected. Notice Luke chapter 10 and verse 15, another reference to Hades in the New Testament. Luke 10 and verse 15. Jesus is speaking here about Capernaum and he says, and you Capernaum who are exalted to heaven will be what? thrust down to Hades. The King James Version says you will be thrust down to hell. But what is Jesus really saying? He's saying though you exalt yourself to heaven you will be thrust down to the grave, the place of death. The word there is Hades. Now let me ask you, what are the two main characteristics of the grave? The, it has two great characteristics. Number one, it is a place of absolute silence. And secondly, it is a place of perfect darkness. Let's read a couple of verses on that. Go with me to Psalm 115 and verse 17. Psalm 115 and verse 17. It says there, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into what? Into silence. Notice Job 17 verses 13 and 14. Job 17 verses 13 and 14. It says there, If I wait for the grave, that's Sheol, as my house, if I make my bed in what? In darkness. If I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, you are my mother and my sister. So what happens when you go down to Sheol or the grave? You're in absolute what? Absolute silence and absolute darkness. And the Bible says that the worms are there. Now what do the worms eat? Do they eat your soul? Of course not. They eat the body, they eat the person, right? The material substance of the person. Now I want you to imagine, just for a few moments, the uh, uh, an analogy that I want to share with you about the grave. I want you to imagine that Satan is the jailer. The grave is the jail. The dead are the prisoners. By the way, this is a biblical analogy. The dead are the prisoners. The jailer is inside the grave and he has the keys inside. And he says to Jesus, I dare you to come here in here and grab the keys. 
And what does Jesus do? Jesus dies. He goes into the grave. Metaphorically, he grabs the keys from the jailer. He says, give me those keys. And he unlocks the door from inside and comes out. Now you say, is that a biblical analogy? It most certainly is. Notice Revelation 1 verses 17 and 18. Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 and 18. No matter how silent and dark the grave is, Jesus, the Bible tells us, has the keys. And the word Hades is used in these two verses that we're going to read now. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell dead at his feet. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who what? Who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And now notice, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I have the keys of where? I have the keys of the grave and of death. Listen folks, when Jesus Christ went into the grave, the devil dared him. He said, I dare you to die and, and come into the grave. Jesus says, okay, I accept your dare. So Jesus dies, he goes into the grave, he grabs the keys, he opens the door from the inside and he comes out and he says, I am the resurrection and the life because I live, you will live also. Amen. Jesus doesn't have the keys to hell as if he opens and closes hell and keeps people burning and then lets them out when they're burning as if the Bible taught some idea of purgatory. Absolutely not. When Revelation 1, 17 and 18 says that Jesus has the keys of Hades, it means that he has the keys to what? He has the keys to the grave. Notice Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. We have a very in interesting expression here about Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the what? the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now it says Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Was Jesus the first person to resurrect from the dead? No. We have three people in the Old Testament that resurrected from the dead. We have of course Moses. We have also uh, the widow's son in the days of Elijah. And we have that strange episode where an individual was thrown into a pit and he touched the bones of Elisha and he resurrected. In the New Testament before Jesus died and resurrected, there were also three resurrections. The, uh, the son of the widow of Nain resurrected, Jairus' daughter and Lazarus were resurrected by Jesus. So firstborn from the dead does not mean that Jesus is the first to resurrect. What this expression means is that the death and resurrection of Jesus determines the possibility of us resurrecting if we should die. In other words, our hope is centered in Him because Jesus went into the grave, He grabbed the keys, and now He can open the grave for His children who die in Christ. The Bible tells us that the hope of God's people is not found in some immortal soul that flies off to heaven at the moment of death. The Bible tells us that the hope of the Christian is found in the resurrection of the dead, not the immortality of the soul. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 16 to 22. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 16 to 22. Notice that the resurrection is the key to eternal life. If when we died, our soul flew off to heaven and our soul were immortal, what importance would there be that Jesus should die and resurrect to give us life if we already have immortal life within ourselves, which we don't? It says there in 1 Corinthians 15, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. How could they have perished if supposedly they went to heaven when they died? Makes no sense. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable, but more. But now Christ is risen 
from the dead, and has become the first fruits, there it is again, of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. In fact, you have somewhat of a paradox in the idea that Jesus overcame death by death. By the way, how do you neutralize the venom of a serpent? You neutralize it by using anti-venom. And what is anti-venom made from? It is made from venom. In other words, venom overcomes and conquers venom. Jesus by death overcame death. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. It says there, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, and here comes the key portion, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now there's, there's no reason to fear death anymore. Because this text tells us, uh, tells us that Jesus, through death, overcame he who has the power of death. By the way, it reminds me of that story of the serpent that was raised up in the wilderness. You know, in the Bible, usually the serpent represents the power of Satan and sin. And yet a serpent is used to illustrate Jesus. Jesus says, as a serpent was raised in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be raised up. So that as the people looked upon the serpent, they lived. As people look upon me, Jesus says, they shall live. Why would a serpent be used to illustrate Jesus when the serpent represents the power of Satan and the power of sin? The simple reason is that Jesus, the Bible tells us, became sin. Jesus came and died so that by becoming sin and by dying for sin, he could overcome death and He could give us everlasting life. Now let's go to Revelation 20 verses 13 through 15 where we find the last two references to the word Hades in the New Testament. Revelation 20 and verses 13 through 15. It says here, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Those who were in, in the sea were what? Dead. dead. Very well. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. Who were the ones in uh, Hades? The dead. Not those who are living and writhing in pain, in the flames, in misery, in hell. It's not what it says. It says the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. By the way, how could you translate the word Hades there? The grave. Very simply. And it says, And they were judged, each one according to his works. Verse 14, Then death and Hades, that is death and the grave, were what? Were cast into the lake of fire. See, see, so you say, see, Hades does have to do with fire. Yeah, but Hades is not the place where the fire burns. The Bible says that Hades is thrown into the fire that burns. Are you with me? So if you say that Hades is hell, then you're saying that hell was thrown into hell. The fact is that Hades is what? Hades is the grave. So when it says in verse 14, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? The second death, that is final death, from which there will be no resurrection. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And by the way, this is the reason why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26 that the last enemy that will be destroyed is what? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Because Jesus has overcome death. Jesus has overcome the grave. He went in and came out with the keys according to Scripture. And that's the reason why after death is destroyed in the lake of fire, after the grave is destroyed in the lake of fire, 
then God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Let's read about it in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more what? No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have what? For the former things have passed away. By the way, Jesus illustrated the glorious destiny awaiting God's people when he went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his disciples. You probably know the story. Jesus went up there and uh, he was transfigured in the sight of the disciples. That is, he was glorified like he's going to look at his second coming. And the Bible tells us that there on the Mount appeared two individuals speaking with Jesus. The Bible identifies them as Moses and Elijah. Now if you examine Scripture carefully, you're going to notice by comparing Deuteronomy 34 verses 5 and 6 with the book of Jude verse 9, that when Moses died, Michael the archangel came to call Moses out of the tomb. In other words, Moses died, resurrected, and was taken to heaven. And of course we all know about Elijah. Elijah was translated to heaven in a chariot of fire without experiencing what? Without experiencing death. Now Jesus had some, said something very interesting to the disciples immediately before he was transfigured. He says, there are some of you here who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And even Albert Schweitzer, that great philanthropist that worked so many years in Africa, was somewhat confused. He said, you know, Jesus believed that he was going to establish the kingdom. Uh, he told his disciples that they were going to see his kingdom before they died, but Jesus was simply wrong. He was a deluded fanatic, is what he says. Because he believed that he was going to bring the kingdom, but he actually never, uh, never brought the kingdom. His hopes never materialized. There's another way of looking at that. You see, immediately after Jesus said that some of those who are here will not die, speaking to all of the disciples, some of those were the three, by the way, that went up to the mount. Some of those who are here will not die until you have seen the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Those three went up to the top of the mountain, which were Peter, James, and John. And they saw Jesus transfigured as He will look at His second coming. And by the way, on that mountain, was represented in miniature Christ's total kingdom. First of all you have Jesus in the center, the one who went into the tomb, grabbed the keys from the devil and came out and said, because I live, you will live also. But also there was Moses representing those who die in Christ and will be resurrected. And you had also Elijah who was translated to heaven from among the living. The Apostle Paul described this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he said that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then it speaks about the dead and the living being caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. In other words, on the Mount of Transfiguration you have a mini kingdom you have a representation of what it's going to be like when Jesus comes in power and glory to rescue his living saints and to rescue those who have died in Jesus Christ. So we've studied two very important words that we find in the Old and New Testament. We found the word Sheol in the Old Testament and we've analyzed the word Hades in the New Testament. You tell me, in the light of what we've studied, should the word Sheol be translated grave? Absolutely. Should the word Hades be translated grave as well, with the exception of the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where Jesus is using their beliefs, according to what we've studied, to transmit a great truth. In the other ten references, should the word Hades be translated grave? Absolutely. So, what I'm saying is that we are not to fear the grave. We are not to fear a moment of silence. We are not to fear a place of absolute pitch darkness. Because 
Jesus has taken the sting out of death. The Bible uses sleep as a symbol of death. How many of you are afraid of going to sleep tonight? So, oh, it's terrifying! I have to go to sleep tonight! <laughs> of course not! Well, death shouldn't scare you any more than sleep. It's just that you sleep a little bit longer, that's all. But as there is an awakening from sleep, there will be an awakening from death. The Apostle Paul says that death now is like a wasp without a stinger. Let me ask you, how much damage can a wasp do without a stinger? He can do you absolutely no damage whatsoever. The Bible says that death is like a shadow. Yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley, the, the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. The question is, how afraid are you of a shadow? A shadow can do you a lot of damage, right? If somebody moves his arm and the shadow crosses you, ooh, that's going to hurt you bad. Of course not. You see, death is a conquered foe because Jesus has conquered the devil, the great foe, who is the prince of death, according to Scripture. Now I'd like to end by reading one verse, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. And here is the critical point, the most important point of everything that we've taken a look at in the last hour. Romans 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In other words, if we have the Spirit of Jesus in our lives, that same Spirit who resurrected Jesus will resurrect us if we should die. That is the glorious hope, folks, of Christians. The hope of Christians is not that, you know, when you die, you go to heaven to be happy with the Lord. You know, if that was the hope, then when you have a funeral, people shouldn't be crying. They should be shouting, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. They should be having a party. Because all oh, my relatives is enjoying that banquet with Jesus in heaven. But you see, people know that that's not the case. And so they have this long, sad face, and they're crying. You know, if our relative went to heaven, we should be overjoyed and happy at it. But the fact is that the hope of the Christian is not found in the immortality of the soul. The hope of the Christian is found in the resurrection of the dead. And if Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, folks, we can be absolutely certain that even if we should die this night, that when Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven, He will call and we will answer. I hope that this is our glorious hope today.